said about stress and football and why that was a whole new stress. I've never experienced that before because it was getting towards the end of a window. So I wouldn't have been able to move or have been locked in at Cheltenham. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, people were questioning it when they first came in and they were in the, in the dressing room and, and people would be like, is that is that them acting? Are they being serious? It's so unique, this club, because obviously every game for every opposition is still the same this season. And there are a lot of people that love the show and whatever. There's also people that are jealous and resent you and that you're their cup final. We can play that Chelsea game in America. Um, I'm warming up, literally, I've been tears coming down my face and I'm like I'm hiding it from everyone not letting anyone see it and you can see like my little girl's on his shoulders and he's like in, evidently in pain but at the time you just he's hiding it so well um, and you're like fucking hell fuck so why didn't you just speak up and say oh. we're going to a pool party and the whole place would just stop and they would have Wrexham all up and around all the screens they'd be playing Wrexham songs we'd be in the best cabanas in the best places it was absolutely nuts. I don't know, it just flew straight over our heads. It was, it was probably the best moment I've ever experienced, other than winning at a football match and, and whatever, but it was like goosebumps. It was, it was mental. It- Welcome back to the Everyday Perspective podcast. Please like the video and subscribe to the channel. Today's guest is Wrexham FC defender and club captain, Ben Tozer. Ben, how are you, mate? Yeah, good, thanks, guys. How are you? Yeah, good, mate. Thanks for coming on. I appreciate the time. I know you're very busy at the moment. Um, Danny and I were just chatting a second ago that as much as we're very aware of the situation at Wrexham, I wonder uh, if there's a couple of people with their head in the sand out there um, who are unaware of the situation. So could you just explain what's been happening at Wrexham over the last couple of years? Yeah, I mean, if you haven't been keeping up to date with any of it, then you can literally have been an ostrich, I think, like you said. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's It's been a bit of a whirlwind since I came to the club two years ago. Um, I joined just off the back of them, Rob and Ryan taking over the club. And uh, the club was obviously in a bit of turmoil before they took over. And then we kind of had Hollywood come to Wrexham, which is bizarre, really. Because if you come to the place, Wrexham, there's not too much going on there as such. But they brought the place to life, um, not just on the pitch and in the stadium, but also in the town as well. Um, everyone just seems so much happier and more buoyant since they've come in. And yeah, it's been it's been a bit of a whirlwind, really. The last two years has been mental, really. So, Did, did you come in before they come in or was you in after? After. So they, I think they took over about the January before and I signed late in the summer that after summer. the next season, yeah. The start of the next season. Nice. So I've been here the last so- two whole seasons. So you knew what you were getting into then? Yes and no, really. I mean, I being a football fan and a bit of a football geek, like love, I love reading stuff and you see a story like that, it was, it was a bit weird really, reading about it on BBC and and seeing and thinking, I wonder, I wonder what it'll be like. I wonder if it will be all that. And um, yeah, being a part of it is, it's, it is weird really because you come in and these guys are, massive stars and um yeah to, to have been a part of it and to see the growth since i've been here as well has been it's been phenomenal that's crazy rob's my hero i've told you yeah, yeah. Rob's my hero. <laughs> all right it was a great to send me like you gotta get him to send me some sort of like facetime or something yeah <laughs> my birthday's in like 10 days all right mate i'll just let you know all right yeah, yeah no pressure mate <laughs> yeah to be honest with you the only time i've ever and i hate asking for anything and, and stuff but uh, my mum's um, 60th was last year, so I asked Ryan to to do a um, a video, uh, and and he sent one straight across, which was which was brilliant. No way! And then I think I might That's have class, said right? before Danny that my my brother's massive into always sunny in Philadelphia, and and again I would never have asked for myself, but my my um, my brother was going over to LA for his his honeymoon, and um, I asked Rob and Rob's guys if they could uh, do anything. You know, just show them the the studio and stuff like that, and they went they went above and beyond and gave him the time of his life, really. And, and they got to see sneak previews of episodes and stuff. Yeah, so yeah, it's brilliant. So, yeah. so what you're basically saying mate, is, if you ask them to come on the podcast, they they probably will. <laughs> yeah, good, luck. <laughs> good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's been a mad one, mate. Because I I don't know if Danny's mentioned, but I'm I'm not much of a football fan. Yeah. 
Um, we have, we've had a couple of uh, football related podcasts and uh, it's a bit of a re- re- sort of role reversal where I'm just sat here a little bit like oh, asking the silly questions and Danny's actually the expert. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but sort of in preparation to this, I've been watching the show and it, it it's obviously produced with like Hollywood sort of level uh, style. And I think Ryan Reynolds is one of the, I think he's the exact producer as well as obviously the owner of Wrexham now. Yeah. Um, and I mean, the watching it, it seems so dramatic and it, it's like really gripping, especially like, you know, the, the sort of first season and the cold. And I guess that's when you came in afterwards. I mean, what does it feel like being being in there? Because obviously you're a season pro, you've, you've played for quite a few different teams. You know, ultimately it's still... League Two, right? Yeah, yeah. They're in League Two now. They yeah. were in, they were in uh, so, conference last yeah. year. Yeah, so still a League Two team, but obviously with all this media coverage, does it feel as is Hollywood as it looks? Well, my first day when I signed my contract, you had to sign a kind of uh, waiver as well to to agree to be filmed and stuff. And uh, I remember my first day turned up to the ground. Normally, turn up to the ground is just a normal occasion, and and you get out of your car here, and then the cameras are immediately like in your face you know they're, they're following you and they've got someone behind them who's doing the sound and they've got the big mic up and things like that and they're literally following you in you kind of don't even know where to look you know you don't want to like do that awkward um stare down the camera at the same time you kind of <laughs> you're aware that they're there but you don't know what to do so it's uh yeah it was it was it took a little bit of getting used to because you'd be in the changing room and you would be having a conversation it could be about the weekend or it could be about anything to do with your life and then they might just come in and then they'd start recording and you'd literally go from chatting to like no no, no one says a word everyone's like you know Mm. i'm not here to talk about my personal life or things i'm not playing up to the camera so yeah it took a little bit of getting used to but they kind of they do you know go into into the background but some of the boys love it though don't they some lads love it yeah i'm kind of the opposite i walk into a room if i walk into a room and i see them in there like the physio room I'll generally turn around and walk straight back out. It's kind of like, yeah, it's it's one of them where, I don't know, you want to you want to mess around and piss around and be a kid and you know what it's like, I guess, at work and things like that. And then you, you kind of don't want to be playing up to the camera, so it's kind of yeah, they catch you at your most boring, really. <laughs> and do, do you think a little bit of that is just is it just because you're a private guy mate or is it that you're maybe a little a little bit older than some of the lads do you think it does it seem to be the younger lads that get into it a bit of both yeah it's a bit of both i mean you know they they kind of from day one they were trying to come to my house and um being around the family and uh which is great like they want to know about you and and it's it's really nice and personable but for me my personal life my family life i like to keep it away and um there's certain things like i would do with my kids and play around with my kids and but if they were there i wouldn't necessarily do it you know just messing around really just being a dad being a kid and yeah and also it wouldn't be fair on the kids putting a camera in their face kind of asking them to do things just for the cameras it's, it's not natural is it so so yeah it took a bit of getting used to really yeah i think um i think i've, I've bins watch like most of the first season I was keeping an eye out for you and I think other than a couple of changing room shots I think there was one it might have been after the Stockport game I think where I think you had maybe your kids with you on the pitch oh, right, okay. um, and, I, and, I, and I think you might have been like literally walked past the camera and said see you later and that was about the extent <laughs> of like your how you were featured so yeah, uh, so yeah fair one it's, it's, have you watched the start of season two yet yeah, I've, I've been on like, a little bit more no probably too much have you? really yeah yeah, is that just because they've cornered you better, mate? Or is it because you've uh, just sort of eased into them being around a bit more? No, it's just it's been around the people that are in it. And there was a kind of changing room uh, halftime scene between me and Paul Mullen. And yeah, it was only like five or ten seconds. But that's kind of a bit more real. I mean, if I'd have walked in the changing room, hadn't known the camera was there, there and then, I probably wouldn't have said what I said. But thankfully, they were hidden. Right, okay. Things. They did capture, you know, natural things, which is, yeah, it's great, really. I'll, I'll look forward to that. I haven't watched that either yet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Was so, it? Was it? Was you? Was you just kicking off at each other? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yeah. It was just a, a moment of, you know what it's like. It gets heated in the dressing room. Yeah, I've fucking been there. Mate. Yeah, it was frustrating, and, and, and it's never. It's just never personal. You just go. I've walked in. I've basically said you should have fucking passed it. Um, you know, and uh, he said I didn't fucking see him or whatever, and it was kind of you know that was probably a bit more turned down, but. 
Yeah, I mean, I felt at the time I felt angrier than I kind of looked, but uh, yeah, it is, it's, it's never personal, <laughs> is it, when you fall out of the pitch? Must, it must be so weird, though, because those documentaries are fascinating for fans to watch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then even still, they're still not getting the full view because as footballers, you're obviously, you're like, you're like, you know, mini celebrities and obviously the top, top players are, are actual celebrities. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's hard, isn't it? Because you, like you said, you dumb, you, you dull yourself down because you don't want to come across a certain way or you, you don't want people to perceive you a certain way as well. Yeah, exactly. And like I said, some people will play up to the cameras, but for me personally, I kind of go the other way, which is a shame really, because I can be a massive child. And uh, again, <laughs> I don't know, you, you have responsibilities and things like that. So yeah, it's hard to it's hard to kind of come across how you want to, but at the same time, you never know what they're going to edit. You don't know what they're going to put in, what they're not going to put in. Going back to what you said before, Rob Rob's the main one. Rob edits everything, you know. Absolutely. Does he? Okay. Is he the one who edits? Does, does he? He does absolutely everything. Yeah, and like, yeah, we we kind of mess around when Rob or Ryan are around, and you kind of joke about. It. Um, we say to Rob like, "Oh, this is Ryan's team," you know, because it it's not. It's actually the opposite, pretty much, but. Yeah, he just kind of... <laughs> Is that... Yeah, yeah. And then Ryan, Ryan came in the dressing room last week, actually, before the game, and, and, and I remember saying to him, Ryan, what do you actually do? Like, Rob seems to do everything. And, you know, he just... just <laughs> this humour, he just comes back as as he would. Well, I'll just come back and say, I'm fucking Deadpool, mate. Yeah, do you know what I mean? That's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So top off, rip his top off, like, yeah. Yeah, just rip his top off, mate. I'm going to cut your fucking head off on Deadpool. Although he's looking a bit skinny, mate, on the documentary. Is he? Yeah, you think back to like Deadpool, but you think back to like Blade 2, I think when he was in that, he was jacked. Yeah, he's fucking Yeah, yeah he's looking like he's, he's, he's getting slim, mate. He's, yeah, he's put on... Dad now, isn't he? Dad, he's, yeah. He's been putting on his muscle and everything for Deadpool 3, but... Is he? Because of all the strikes. Ah, okay. They've, uh, they've had to stop filming. What was that because of? The striking. They're striking in Hollywood, isn't they? Oh, are they? Yeah. yeah. God, it's not just the trains then. <laughs> fucking everything, isn't it? <laughs> That's cool. Jesus yeah. Christ. so mate with the um, obviously you said you signed the waiver so you would have to be on camera Mm. Um, and you're obviously mindful about the cameras being around and obviously you've had that that occasion where you just mentioned where you were having a bit of a row with with Paul Mullen Um, do you find like like as a as a player have you have you have you like changed how you communicate with the other lads through fear of maybe a camera being hit around the corner or something has that had an impact at all yeah no not at all for me I just I kind of know what's right and I know what's wrong and I kind of um, try and implement things how I see it. I'd rather, if I overthink it, then you're not getting me, if you know what I mean. So I'd rather just be straight and up front and and say what what I see. Because not saying, you know, you don't want to come across as a bit of a know-it-all, but I'm experienced. I have kind of been there most of the time and I've kind of seen that. So for me, I kind of feel like I have that experience to pass on and, I've been in a lot of situations in games and half time and stuff and you and you, you kind of get a feel for what's what's what. So yeah, it, it's just good to kind of lend a bit of a guide and hand. Everyone in life seems to kind of not want to be told and be a bit of a know it all, don't they? So it's uh yeah, it can be tough, especially in a kind of ego driven job, I suppose. Yeah, hundred percent. I know I know when we had um Gary Sawyer who was um ex goal captain on. Yeah. And uh, we were just talking about sort of, I guess, the the temperament of some of the younger lads now as well. So you've got sort of your slightly more seasoned players that that maybe say it how it is. Yeah. And then maybe the younger lads coming through maybe wouldn't appreciate that so much. Has that been a challenge for you, do you think? You know what? Here, it's it maybe was at the start, but as it's gone on with the squad, it's massively changed. We've got, we've had such a turnover of players um, that we don't really have that many young lads now. There's, there's very few far. Uh, um, between so it's it's kind of uh, it's easier we've got a lot of experienced players we've got a lot of honest players as well which helps because at the end of the day everyone's in it for themselves everyone's got their own agendas so if you're um, an 18, 19 year old lad trying to get in the first team you'll do whatever you've got to do to kind of get in the team if you're a 32, 33 year old player like me who's fighting daily against them 18, 19 year olds I've got to do what I've got to do I've got to look after myself as well but at the same time, I don't want to be, I'm not as selfish as I possibly was back then because it was all about, it's all about you, isn't it? Whereas, you know, mm. now it's kind of, it's all about the team and, and you've got to do what's right for the team because ultimately in football, if the team wins, you win. So every player wins, whether that's everyone wins on the pitch on a Saturday, you get, everyone gets a bonus or 
you get promoted and you've got promotion on your CV. So it's it's kind of it's massive, really. You know. Mm. Yeah, definitely, mate. And uh, we were just chatting briefly offline about your role as club captain. Um, and, and for me, being, as I say, not not a huge football fan, um, I I know what a team captain is. They wear the armband, they run around on the pitch. But what can you explain to, to I guess, me and the audience as well, what, what a club captain is and what role that is sort of within Wrexham specifically ends, obviously, with the current situation there? Do you arrange the piss-ups? <laughs> yeah, to be honest with you, again, I've, I've kind of gone through that phase where I'm happy for everyone else to just arrange them. You know, it's, it's, I'm easy, I'll just go with the flow. If someone wants a night out in X, X, Y, Z, then I'll just go there. You know, I don't, it, it doesn't really matter to me. I've been there and done it. So, um, but yeah, in terms of jobs, kind of, I do the, when I t- signed, I'll be honest, the ticket situation was a shambles. There was no fine situation. Standards were pretty um, average and just had to kind of raise them and pick them up and, and just run with them and um, and just kind of make sure the dressing room kind of runs itself and no issues kind of go back to staff because they've got their own issues. They've got to work out and sort out the team and everything else ready for a Saturday. So it's kind of just marshalling the dressing room in, in a way, you know, you don't want to, you're not like a linchpin between the gaffer and the, the lads because I don't want to find myself in that situation where I don't, I don't want to be going and saying to the gaffer, look, this, this, and this. Not a chance. In fact, far from it. So you kind of just want to keep peace in the dressing room. That's it. And uh, yeah, it can be hard at times because you're the bad cop, but you got to do what's right at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah, is it just bringing standards as well to the club? Like, because you've been around so much, and I know a lot of the players now that you've got are experience and they've been around, but probably when you first come that first season, I imagine you had to instill a lot of professionalism because it was obviously a non-league club at the time. And then you've come from obviously like league two, league one football for most of your career. Bringing that in, did that, did you, did you have to do that straight away? Yeah, kind of. I didn't want to because I signed after the first game of the season. So it was already, everything was kind of in motion and I was one of the last ones in. So when you first sign a club, you don't really want to come in and be like, you know, what's this, what's that, blah, blah, blah. You kind of sit back, assess and see what's what but at the same time it's kind of like right every Saturday is three points three points are massive that's what we've, that's what we're playing for that's what we live for so you don't want to waste any time but at the same time you don't want to push and push and push but I remember there was a moment we played I think it was Stockport away in that season and it was a bit of a bad performance second half and um, we had it out in the dressing room after and I kind of just relayed what I thought and uh, from then on it kind of became right I'll take over the fines then and make sure the standards are as I see fit. And uh, yeah, it's kind of, you get, you get labeled a dictator, school teacher, whatever. It's kind of, <laughs> who cares at the end of the day, if you know what's kind of right and what's wrong, because at the end it would be a shit show. And also when it comes to Christmas too, if there's no money in the kitty and lads are pulling money out of their own pocket to pay for it, they'll soon be moaning. So it's a, uh, it's a way of, you know, funding that. Mate, fines are important in that dressing room, aren't they? You know what I mean? It's the easiest way to keep standards, mate, even at my shitty level. That's how, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, that's how we kept everyone in check, mate, was fines. Yeah, you know definitely. I mean? Fine for late, dirty boots, not showering was a big one. Um, yeah, just fucking loads, mate. Just loads. If you get booked, fine. Red card, fine. Um, talking back to gaffer, fine. Oh, really? <laughs> We had a list, mate. We had a list, honestly, at, at Marjons of uh, 30 different fines. And uh, We've got yeah, the lad who'd done it, mate, was always on it. We used to go Benidorm every year on it. Yeah. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> a lot of fines, though. Yeah, yeah. Loads. yeah like, if someone, if someone gets fined or something, I'm like, oh, cheers, there you go. That's a pint for me, Christmas day. Yeah, he's like, just trying to make yeah, a bit of humour out of it rather than being like, you are fined, you are fined. Like, you know, it's going to make a bit, <laughs> yeah. yeah, make it a bit light-hearted, really. Because at the end of the day, most football lads are just knobs, and we, you know what I mean. Like you just have that child in you where you just want to fuck around and just play football, really. Yeah, literally. You know yeah. what I mean? Dream job, really, you got on you. So, <laughs> well, everyone's dream wasn't it? I suppose as a kid. Yeah, Majority. yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I say I don't like football. I did when I was a kid, and then wasn't good enough, and now I. I'm resentful, yeah. mate. That's probably why I don't like it anymore. <laughs> resentful. Yeah. So, how does that that sort of club captain role kind of work with the team captain role? Then, does it does it is there kind of pitch uh, responsibilities as well? Or uh, not? Yeah. I mean, the armband is the armband. It's kind of aesthetic, really. Like, I don't know. It's 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 one of them things that everyone thinks all oh, 
the leader on the pitch is the one wearing the armband. For me, you need 11 leaders on the pitch and the lads that come on and come off, you know, everyone's in it together. You're all fighting for that same same result. Everyone's got an opinion. Everyone's everyone's worthy of their opinion as well. So it's, it is, it's not necessarily on the armband. You listen to me. Even though the referees these days, it's kind of they only really want to speak to the, the captain, which I do understand. But um, yeah, I think it's just aesthetic, really, wearing an armband. Some people like to put it on their social media as pictures and stuff like that. And yeah, not for me. What's going on, guys? This episode is sponsored by Eden Clinic for Men, who specialise in men's health and male hormones. The details are on the screen now and in the description below. Head on over to their website and get yourself booked in for a blood test. Select EDP, which is the everyday perspective, to get yourself a discount. In addition to male hormones such as testosterone, these tests also look at other health markers such as diabetes type 2, heart health, liver function and kidney function. The clinic is run by Dr. Angela Service, who featured on episode 13 where she spoke in length about the negative symptoms that men can experience if they're deficient in some of these hormones, such as low mood, low libido, fatigue and weight gain. So if either you, maybe one of your mates, your dad isn't feeling quite right, then it's worth having a look at some of these metrics and some of these markers to see how your health is on the inside. Even if you are feeling tip-top, it's worth having a look now because in the future that may change and it gives you the ability to look back and have a benchmark. This is something that we feel really passionate about, guys, otherwise we literally wouldn't be telling you about it. Dr. Angela Service and her team can work wonders in regard to getting things corrected and improving your life and your health. It isn't something worth taking a chance on, fellas, so get on over and get yourself booked in. Awesome, guys. Thanks for your time. Back to the episode. One of the other things that, that I wanted to ask as well, and, and again, this is something that we talked about with a previous guest, but obviously there's a shit ton of pressure in football, right? Um, like you said, a lot of the times you know, you're kind of, you know, fighting for contract renewals, you're in front of, you know, thousands of fans. And, you know, I know Gary mentioned and, and something that we've talked about, Danny and I, but there's obviously a little bit of sort of issues with mental health in football, especially with like the pressure in younger lads and stuff. And and I just wonder with that added pressure of, of you know, the cameras and just the, the, the level of exposure. And I guess the amount riding on it from sort of Robin Ryan's point of view as well. How have the lads sort of been as a whole kind of like mentally? Are they, you know, is, is it, is it, are they well supported? Are they struggling or have they struggled? I mean, there have been struggles there. You probably see it in season two of this documentary, but a couple of lads have had real big issues off the pitch. Um, in terms of one lad's missus was really, really ill. Um, another lad had a, very very premature baby and, and like real life issues um I, one of my mates last year killed himself so that was an issue Sorry to hear that, mate. um but yeah it's it's tough you, you've obviously just got to get on with it because if you show any sign of weakness really um that gets used against you it can be used against you to pick you on a saturday or you don't seem in the right frame of mind now the club as a whole want to support you but staff the, the gaffer management whatever all they care about is that result on Saturday because ultimately managers are six games away from getting sacked so for them all that matters is the here and the now uh, yes you are a human being we want to look after you off the pitch but if you're no good to me right now come back in a week or two like not like go away for a week or two but maybe you'll be better selected for next week so you have them pressures mentally where you kind of you are fighting against like I said I'm 33 there's 19, 20-year-old centre-halves at the club who are very, very, very good. Um, they maybe just lack the experience, that's it. But I'm fighting against them daily. They're physically not better than me, but they're mm. younger than me. They've not got the way. Yeah. They're, they're 19, 19, 20, aren't they? The yeah. Fuckers. So, yeah, <laughs> we've been there. So you, you kind of, you're fighting against that. And then not only that, they're bringing in, um, they can, this club can bring in a player, in any window because they have the financial power to do so. So everyone's a commodity, whether it's in football, in work, in life. And yeah, at the end of the day, you, you're fighting weekly, daily to, to stay in that team. And then, then you've got the game on a Saturday. You've got the pressure of uh, getting the three points. If you don't get the three points, was it your fault? Why why they didn't? I'm always someone who kind of looks at himself. Why do we concede that goal? It's my fault straight away. I look at myself always. Um, and then maybe put a little bit too much pressure on myself. But... At the same time, I've been blessed since I've had kids, so I've kind of learned to compartmentalise, to deal with football is football. When I go home, switch off, kids are kids. That's my ultimate main main aim in life. So, um, 
yeah, I mean, in football, there are issues. There's also the issues of where people uh, taking tablets to get by, to get through games, you know, anti-inflammatories and become dependent on them and things like that. So, um, which isn't going to be good. What about snus, mate? Yeah, snus is huge. Snus has been huge in football. I didn't, I didn't realise that until recently, and like, I didn't, I didn't know how many footballers t- like yeah. use snus. I've, I've never heard of it. What is it? Snus is the tobacco that people your gums, in mate. But it makes you really like fucking ill. It's horrible. Yeah. So everyone, I mean, so is, that a, is that a thing, Ben? Is it? I must be the only footballer in the world that hasn't tried it. I reckon. <laughs> really? I've got to okay. be up there. It's yeah, it's that high in football. It's um, but it's, yeah, yeah, it's tobacco. It. It's it's mad. I mean, I came across it when I went to Newcastle at seventeen. So what's that? Sixteen years ago. Um, but yeah, it's 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 rife in football, and yeah, there's them addictions to that. And then when you've got so much time on your hands as a kid, people get into gambling because they've got nothing else to do. They go to the bookies and they become gamblers, and yeah, all these all these kind of issues that come along with it, which is it's sad really. And then you've also got when my time comes, when I retire, that's going to be, it's going to be huge. I've been used to being in the dressing room every single day, nearly of my adult life, um, to then go and sit at home in the front room and stare at walls or go and get a job and, and whatever. It's, it's going to be, it's going to be tough. So, um, yeah, I mean, it is tough, but at the same time, it's, it's a dream job and there's going to be pros and cons to every single job and uh, you just got to take, take them both really. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What's the um, so this? What do you call it? Was snuzz? Have you never heard of snuzz? I've never heard of so it. So snuzz is tobacco, and it's different strengths, and it comes in a little, uh, like little, little circle, and um, yeah, you just basically put it in your gums, and it's it's. I imagine it's the same sort is it of just like a stimulant nicotine then? that you get from smoking, and it just stimulants. Yeah, but it. I tried it. Oh, no, I tried. It, I tried it once when I was out, and um, it made me so ill. Like it made me actually sick. I was like. Pfft. Because a load of the football lads that I hang around with, they all do snuzz. They all do snuzz. And then, yeah, I, I, fuck it, I don't see the point in it. I just was like, what the fuck is that? So it sounds, so, yeah, so it's, obviously tobacco is a stimulant. So I'm guessing that's why they do but it's it. It's really strong. Is that not considered a p- p- performance hunter? Is that legal uh, in football? I think it's the opposite. Yeah. It calms down. It seems to calm a lot of people down. Really? Oh, okay. Well, yeah. Going back to what Danny said there, it's actually it's the amount of times I've seen people take it for the first time. And one, I think, <laughs> idiot. Because it's you know it's addictive, but it's hilarious watching someone go through the roller coaster of being up and up and down on it. Is in terms it's of crazy. like one minute they're like thingy, they feel chilled, and then they're like, "Whoa, what's going on?" I mean, I just sweated. I just sweated loads, and then was sick everywhere within like twenty minutes. Room my night went on, went sleep. Yeah, a lot of people yeah. try it when they have a drink. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. I think it's going to become more and more as well, unfortunately, because they sell it now in the UK. It's really weird, isn't it? Because yeah it's really weird because i never heard of it for years and years and years never ever heard of it and then all of a sudden you know all the lads had, had snuzz you know and then they were like you know all the pros are t- you, you know like having snuzz and then it's just yeah it's just like filtered down yeah it's cool though, that's the thing yeah it's like smoking without like smoking yeah i think, I think in, oh super cool mate yeah i think in, in life and obviously in football it's about a lot for a lot of people it's about being cool right it's it's sad for me I find that everyone just wants to be kind of liked and cool and follow the crowd and be in with the crowd and stuff like that and I think it's just another thing that um, people do to, to kind of fit in at times uh, which again like I said it's quite sad really yeah no fair one mate no I've never heard of that interesting um, so with like the all the stuff you just mentioned mate so obviously the I guess the pressure like you know the sort of prescription drug use, drug use and occasionally gambling all that sort of stuff um you know being at Wrexham now because obviously they're a league two side but they've obviously got all this sort of sort of uh, money and publicity is there like much in the way of holistic sort of wraparound support for the players like do they have do you know do you have access to um i don't know like therapists for like mental well-being and that type of thing yeah. is that is that something that's come in since the the, the purchase yeah definitely like I say, everything's kind of gone gone like that since I've kind of come here. And uh, HR, lady called Julie at the club, she's fantastic. If you've got any issues, you need anything, you contact her. We were, we're also lucky being in the Football League. Uh, if you've ever been in the Football League, you're also a member for life. But we have a thing called the PFA, so they represent the players. Yeah. Um, you can contact them if you ever had an issue. I've had it um, 
what seven eight years ago was you know struggling with anxiety um and you know mental health whatever um and i was went to see a counselor i've seen a counselor like six times it was one of the best things i've ever done um it's definitely something i would recommend it's i've recommended to everyone whether you feel like you're in a good place um or not i think seeing a counselor is incredible you get everything off your chest you know you can't you can't you don't want to go to the pub to the pub with your mate and just bring them down do you you don't want to be sitting them then yeah. they don't want to be sat there hearing it so it's nice to go and speak to some random who doesn't actually give a shit about your life wants to be there for you and yeah it's great yeah yeah and no, i think it's um yeah i think there's been a lot of stigma around blokes talking mate and obviously there's a lot of uh you know sort of more recent encouragement to do that but something we've talked about a lot is still a lot of lads just don't feel comfortable with it no. so I think if you've got that third party that you can talk to mate I think that's yeah that's great yeah how does that go down in the change room is is everyone uh, a bit more accepting of that because I know when I was well only a few years ago but if I was playing a lot of the lads would get like ripped if they really like shown any emotion yeah, you know yeah, yeah. I don't know what it's like now if we moved on a little bit but I can't imagine it's moved on too much in like three years you know no yeah I, listen you're in a a male dominant changing room it's you know you've got egos you've got pride you've got all that to contend with you show any sign of weakness generally people pray on it it's like being at school it's it is yeah it is mate. you know it's it's that's just the harsh reality of it, but it's also great at the same time. It's brilliant. You've got the banter just flying around left, right and center. You've got people messing up people's gear and, and you know, whatever. And it's, yeah, it's shit on that person at the time, but you give it and take it and you get on with it. And you know, it's, that's the only thing I miss. I don't miss football. That's the I just I miss the changing room. The most, yeah. Do you know what I mean? That's, it. that's the honest truth. I say it all the time when I see any of my mates, I'm like, how are you getting on? Blah, blah, blah. And then, well, they'll, they'll tell me and I really, I don't give a shit about how they're yeah. getting on. I just, what's happening in the change room like that <laughs> what do you replace that with that's the thing isn't it what do you actually replace that with it's hard well I've, I've replaced it mate with jiu-jitsu and that's that's been huge for me yeah and uh, I, I said to you on the phone mate I, I fell in love with it but I, for about a year 18 months mate I, I tried loads of things I just tried it in the gym and tried going crossfit for a bit and tried tried all sorts of stuff but with jiu-jitsu you can like it, it's something to focus on yeah and uh, I think as you know, obviously you're your top level footballer. So for you as well, you know, if you ever went into something like jujitsu, it's it's like a puzzle that can never be fixed. You know, you can never finish it. So you become a little bit obsessed with it. And then when you start getting a little bit better, you learn a little bit more and then it opens up even more. So yes, yeah, it that that's what's helped me, mate. But I, I genuinely think if I didn't find jujitsu for whatever reason, I would still be a bit like Lost. pissed off because I just haven't, yeah, I just wouldn't have, I'd probably just work more. Yeah, because yeah. I wouldn't have a hobby as such, you know, going to the gym's fine. And I, I always like lifting weights and doing stuff like that, but I never, I never see the gym as like a hobby. I, I more see it as like a, a thing I, I have to do to keep myself yeah, fit. Necessity. You know, a necessity yeah. because I don't want to, you know, I, I want to keep fit. Mm. It's not like, it's not the same buzz or feeling as playing football with your mates. Yeah. 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 I get that as well. Yeah. It must be tough. Yeah. I think it is a tough one, mate. I think so, so many lads get isolated. Um, you know, because I think pop culture is kind of gone these days, it seems, yeah. you know what I mean? So, you know, sort of, yeah, I think that club, that kind of club atmosphere, I think, yeah, I think it's, it's something to keep hold of for sure, mate. Um, with, um, with, with Rob and Ryan, so obviously, you know, on, on, on screen, they always look like a good crack. Um, so I always wonder, because I'm mindful that they're actors and they're producing a show. Um, they do seem like nice blokes, though, and I, I feel like they do care about the club and the players and the people, but they have got a fucking lot of money invested in you guys and that club. So, like, off camera, are they, are they as they seem on camera, or, or do you find that there is, like, a like an edge to them because they do have so much invested? Yeah, well, they're, Robert, you know, they're, they're humble guys. They're just, they're brilliant and they're easy to be around. I mean, Rob's probably more invested um, business-wise because he's, it was his idea and everything like that. But also Ryan has become addicted to it himself. I mean, you probably see it in season one of the documentary. He's uh, he's fully invested now. And I mean, they are very, again, personable. They they will message you. They will ring you when anything good or bad is going on in your life. Also, if you do something good or bad on a Saturday, they're there for you, which is so unusual. 
for an owner and I've never in my career I've never come across anything like it it's so it's so refreshing um yeah I mean they're doing it their way and it seems to be working at the moment yeah no it's it's, it's mad man that, that's why I asked because I, I don't know I guess the cynic in me I'm like right it's it's a it's a tv show that they're, they're very good actors you know and are they just playing a part but it sounds like that is just them they're just that 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 nice that invested yeah yeah definitely I mean people were questioning it when they first came in and they were in the, in the dressing room and, and people would be like is that is that them acting are they being serious because well, they're, they're obviously so good at their job but also people like yourself are going to be cynics and second guess what what's their motives and things like that but as time's gone on they've just you've seen it's genuine you, you you would you'd kind of smell the bullshit i think if if it was if it was there. um yeah they've done so much for the club and the community it's it's, it's incredible i've watched the always sunny podcast like since they've actually started it and yeah you can tell from a podcast what someone's really like and yeah rock Rob's fucking ledge, mate. He genuinely yeah. is like he's wife, such a nice mate, guy. Oh, mate, D, sweet D. Yeah. <laughs> mate, I'm so obsessed with this fucking program. I saw mate. the uh, I saw the the clip. I think where they were on like a talk show, yeah. and she she was talking about the bit when I think again I think it was when they beat Stockport. I think when you beat Stockport, maybe, and she turned around to Rob to give him a big hug, and then he just jumped on Ryan. I was fucking crying. With that. <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> yeah, I mean they they. They were, it was great. They joined us in, in Vegas when we went there for our postseason celebration and Rob and Ryan were there. No, not Rob and Ryan, sorry, Rob and Caitlin were there and their friends as well, um, Brian and Mel. But it was great to see them without without them being mic'd up and um, it was just great. We had such a great time. They were they were brilliant. It was such a laugh and you could see them. They were more relaxed as well. And uh, yeah, I mean, they didn't have to come. They didn't have to, to, to do that and party with us and whatever, but... It was great. Memories for a lifetime, really. Yeah. What was that? What was it like? Because obviously you're a pro footballer, mate. So you've always had like a level of celebrity status within the towns that you've like played for. But being in like Vegas with like A-listers, like what what was that experience? Like what were people like around like Vegas reacting to it like? Well, we never actually walked down the strip because we were kind of we were so well treated. It was it was bonkers. We would go into we had. Our, our kind of schedule was um, restaurant nine o'clock, nightclub eleven o'clock. Next day, pool party one o'clock. Restaurant nine o'clock, <laughs> nine, eleven o'clock. Repeat and repeat. Um, it was insane, and uh, we were treated like royalty. It was absolutely bizarre. We'd go into a pool party, and the whole place would just stop, and they would have Wrexham all up and around all the screens. They'd be playing Wrexham songs. We'd be in the best cabanas in the best places. It was absolutely nuts. I don't know. I mean, obviously, the whole Welcome to Wrexham thing is huge in America. Uh, it's bigger, bigger there than it is here. So, yeah. yeah, it was, it was, it was nuts. It was great as well because in Vegas, everyone's just there to party and have a great time. No one really gave a shit about autographs, photos. They didn't give a shit about us. Really. They just were there to have a great time, and so were we. So, yeah, yeah. And was that was that part of the uh, the preseason tour that you did? No, so that was part of an agreement. Like uh, last preseason, so every year I'll kind of um, speak to the lads and go through what bonuses we kind of feel like we deserve if we do certain things and, and whatever. And, and uh, between me and Sean Harvey, the, the advisor to the board, he, we agreed that if we got promoted, um, they'd take us to Vegas. So, yeah. Class. <laughs> That's good negotiations there, mate. I know, yeah. It was kind of a last minute thing as well. So we'd agreed all the figures and everything. And then right at the end, I was like, oh, yeah, by the way, if we get promoted, it takes us to Vegas. And he was like, yeah, I'm sure that, that'll be fine. So, yeah, <laughs> it was the best, the best thing I've ever, ever agreed in my life, I think. Yeah. yeah, well done, mate. That's fucking quality. And I guess, like, you know, as much as there's, there's obviously a few players um, that have obviously come down a couple of leagues and have probably been paid you know, the, the the kind of reflective salary of that. But there's probably a lot of lads there that are just on sort of a standard League Two wage. So I guess that sort of trip to like Vegas is probably unlike anything they've ever seen, right? Yeah, and I mean, well, we have Ben Foster with us because he's retired now and he's been three or four times. Um, and he said the best trip he's ever been on in his life. And that's... <laughs> really? <laughs> he's been with other clubs and he was like, this was this tops them all by, you know... Kind wow. of so yeah, even for for someone like that, that status to and also to have that kind of probably money and wealth to to have 
said that is it just shows how how good a trip that was and what was that um that preseason tour like mate because i was so envious i was looking at who you were playing week in week like over the over the few weeks mate and i was like he must be fucking loving this it's like <laughs> You know, it must have been insane, mate. I, I watched loads of the games and stuff, and I, and I, I got my boy to watch a few as well. And he was just like, he was like, "What's Ben like, Dad?" And I was like, "Just a normal bloke." And, and he was like, "What? Well, well, has he got to get all their shirts?" And and I was like, "I don't know. I'll ask him." <laughs> so there, did you get any shirts? And did you? Did yeah, you no. Oh, no, no, again, we got there. We, we we're in a place called Chapel Hill, where it's um, North Carolina. We, we trained at like the university facilities. They were like out of this world they were better than any Premier League training facility I've ever seen um, and it's just no a college it was nuts so we played we played um, Chelsea at their stadium called I think it's called the Keenan Stadium uh, I think I was like 50 50,000 and we got there and everyone was like game sold out by the way and we're like what we're like yeah yeah game sold out 50,000 like no way so yeah we played Chelsea they had a good team out we, we did we got, we got dick 5-0 but we did actually Bizarrely, we, we played well. Um, but yeah, after the game, I mean, I played against him before, um, Sterling, when he was at Man City. And after the game, I was like, oh, do I have your shirt? He's like, yeah, yeah, no worries. Made like a massive effort to, to sort me out with it. So yeah, I grabbed Sterling's shirt for that one. And then we played um, LA Galaxy at their stadium. So we flew to the West Coast then. We spent a bit of time in LA. Again, they, they kind of treated us to... You know, we, we we never had any downtime. It was if you got spare time, let's go and um, let's go and explore. So it took us, to, you know, the rodeo drive and things like that. Um, but yeah, we played LA Galaxy, and to be fair, we played LA Galaxy two because the first team had a game a few days later. But yeah, one of the lads for them had asked me for my shirt, so I gave him in mine, and then I get I got his off him as well. I was like, no, I don't just want to give you my shirt. Let me have yours. So I've got an LA Galaxy shirt too, which is pretty cool. Class. Um, and then we went to San Diego. We played against Man U, which is uh, phenomenal. Like the, the again, I don't know how many was in the stadium, but the state it was the first ever football match in that stadium. So we broke the record and all that stuff. Tickets sold and whatever. But before before the game, they do the national anthem. It's all like a massive show, and uh, there was a massive um, what would you call it? Royal Air Force aircraft. Flew, was, <laughs> was it? That's so American, isn't oh, it? Oh no, it's so oh, American. Yeah. At, the, at the end of the national anthem, the timing of it, obviously, they just flew straight over our heads, and it was it was probably the best moment I've ever experienced, other than winning at a football match and and whatever. But it was like goosebumps. It was it was mental. Did, did, um, didn't you beat? Didn't you beat United? Yeah, yeah, we won. Was it three one? Yeah, three one. Um, yeah. You know, they had a lot of um, younger lads out and stuff, but it was, yeah, oh, yeah, it was it was phenomenal. And then we flew back over to the um, East Coast, and that's when we went to Philadelphia for two days, uh, played against Philadelphia Union, um, which was wicked, and did all the rocky steps and things like that. And, uh, yeah, I mean, the owners, Rob especially, was at the majority of the games, and, uh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was surreal and, uh, you know, a trip of a lifetime, really. Because isn't isn't Rob uh, based in Philly, or it doesn't he support Philly like the the American yeah. football team? I think he's from Philly. I don't know where he's yeah. based. I'm going to say maybe LA. Uh, LA now, yeah, yeah. But yeah, again, I don't 100 percent know. I think that's just what you kind of hear through the through the grapevine, really. But yeah, he's uh, definitely a Philly guy and loves Philly, and obviously you yeah. yeah. <laughs> loves Philly and. The Eagles are his well, team. It's been always sunny all the time, mate. Yeah. It's always in there, mate. Any chance he can get. Yeah, it, always, it always gives me a bit because I've never watched it. I've never watched Always Sunny. And uh, yeah. oh, the, I got all the lads to sign my shirt, you know, because we got promoted. And Rob and Rob were there for the parade and stuff, the open top bus. And uh, I was like, oh, do you mind signing the shirt? Like, I left the space and then Rob signed it uh, to my number one fan and then obviously signed it as well. Because like, obviously just Gives me sticks. I've never watched this program. Yeah, man, that's fucking Sick, cool. Man. That's so cool. And then when you when we asked you at the start if you knew what you're signing up for, I guess it's all that sort of stuff that you probably didn't quite expect, though, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, I didn't really, being honest with you, I didn't really know Rob and not being a massive film guy. I'd never watched Ryan Reynolds' films. Uh, no, you never watched a single film of Ryan Reynolds? <laughs> Rob, no, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I do not. 
No. No, so I've watched Deadpool. You've never watched since. Deadpool? Yeah, I've seen them now. I've seen them now since, <laughs> yeah. yeah. They're brilliant. Um, yeah, class. Again, that's why he gives me sticks. I've watched Ryan. I'm like, no, no, but I've, I've seen Ryan's films. I've not seen yours. <laughs> I kind of forget this. I've got, a, I've got a Deadpool tattoo on my back. Have you actually? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but yeah. No way. Sure, I'll show us one. Yeah, I've got a Deadpool. God, I want to see it now. Yeah, you've got to show us. No, I'll look at Really, I'll, make, send, I'll send you a pic, mate. Making him blush, mate. Stop yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have really, though, mate. I've got a yeah, fucking... I believe you. I've got all the Marvel you characters, I know. <laughs> mate, if I don't... you got to tell him that now, so i get another birthday message from uh, yeah, Rob Amoy now, all right? Yeah, fair one. So, yeah, so you had... So you didn't really, uh, so you hadn't really kind of experienced them at all, their movies or anything, so... No, no, and, and when they kind of walked in the room for the first time and stuff, I just didn't really feel anything. Um, you know, just being being absolutely honest, it was yeah, great. Is the owners we're here to work there? Let's crack on. You know, it wasn't it wasn't about them at the time, and it was they came around at game time, and so it was like, listen, this is more important. This is why we're here. I've signed up for this, not to get involved in all of this. But yeah, but now knowing them better is that they're, they're just quality guys and you envy what they they kind of they do and what they've done yeah i think i think meeting meeting those types of people you, you eventually you, they're just normal people aren't they they're just really yeah. good at what they fucking do, <laughs> do yeah. you know what I mean? the only time i've ever been starstruck in my life was when last season we were playing a game we, we were in the change room before the game and um the change room door opened and sean harvey was there and you kind of think sean doing come in the dressing room normally in the physio room area and uh literally Will Farrell walked in and I was like I was about to say it was Will Farrell wasn't it I'll fucking remember that I was so yeah. jealous I was like wow you know and I have seen all his films I love his films um, and I was literally like yeah a little bit speechless but yeah oh, what a guy as well it seems like such a great guy mate I think Step Brothers is my all time <laughs> my, <laughs> my all time favourite films Talladega Nights is my favourite I was about to say Talladega Nights is Elf, Elf for me yeah, help quality. Yeah. Shake and bake, baby. Shake yeah. and bake. <laughs> I think that's my. I think that's still my WhatsApp thing from about twelve years ago. I put on there: if you ain't first, you're last. I I might oh, mate, it's so yeah. good, wasn't it? That came out of nowhere. That film as well. Like I just randomly rented it from Blockbuster one night, and I was, I was just fucking. Yeah. Have, have, was you, have you ever noticed? You know the Flo Rash guard that I've got, the old one. Yeah. Have you ever looked closely to the uh, the white? No. It's a. It's a. It's a um, Step Brothers. Thing. Oh, is it? Yeah. <laughs> was that? Yeah. So the club, the club that we train at, mate, they've got yeah. all these rash guys that we wear when we do nogi, and uh, the old version. I don't know why they've ditched it, but the white on it is like a really subtle picture of those two from uh, from that film. <laughs> oh, really? that's, 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 yeah, he's been, yeah. I've been training with him for he's never noticed. Yeah. Step brothers. Yeah. On the um, case. Yeah. 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 yeah sick. Yeah, good films. Uh, mate, I wanted to ask a little bit about your, your career, actually, as well, because obviously Danny knows a lot about it, um, but I'm less familiar, mate. Um, where where did you join Wrexham from? Uh, I was at Cheltenham before. So Cheltenham, uh, we were in League One, so the year before I signed here, we just won League Two. Um, and yeah, it was tough, actually. Tough to tough decision to leave. I didn't actually want to leave because I was, I was the captain there. We just won the league. Um, yeah, and I was just loving it. The dressing room was was brilliant. Um, yeah, it was it was a real real tough decision to to go down two divisions and um, yeah, ultimately not know what you're getting into. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that that was kind of where I was going with the the question, mate. To be honest, was obviously yeah the decision making process around that, and you know, obviously won't ask you you know about your financials or anything like that. But you you kind of said you weren't overly familiar with Rob and Ryan dropping like two leagues and then moving further away from your hometown as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you know, what was that decision-making process? Like what were the pros and cons for you at the time? So, yeah, it's, I, I said to my, my wife and I was like, look, Wrexham have come in for me. And she was li literally like, what? Like didn't have a clue about any of it. I was like, well, if you want to know a little bit, just what, read this article on it. Cause I, like I said before, I'd been reading and, and, I was interested in to see what was going on because it was big news that they, they bought the club. And then she was like, all right, okay. Um, well, why would you want to go there then? I was like, well, look, the financial security for our family 
is uh, it's only going to be better. I'm not getting any younger. I'm at the end of my career, not end of my career, but coming towards the end of my career. Um, and, you know, that's 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 what's on the table, basically. I've got that, Wrexham, for, with that contract. I've got a year left at Cheltenham. We're in League One. We've just uh, um, had an unbelievable season. Cheltenham, Cheltenham was kind of nearly at the ceiling of where it could really realistically reach. Um, so it took a while, it took two weeks to do the whole the whole process, but Sophie actually turned around to me and said, well, you know, you've got player of the year, you've got supporters player of the year, you're in team of the year, you've played every minute of every game at Cheltenham, you've captained the team to promotion, won the league. Realistically, you're going to go and do that again? Like, you're, you're there. If you went there, you can do that again. That, that buzz that you've had and all that excitement that you've had, you realistically could do that again. I was like, I'd never actually thought of that. So for her to give me that kind of angle on top of the security, so you've now got a project there as well. So you've got the security, family security, and then you've got the project there as well. It was just something I then immediately was like, yeah, got to do it. It's, it is further away from home. Um, but those two things outweigh, you know, all the cons. So, uh, so yeah, I, I, I told the club, situation I said look um, I've got a year left here at Cheltenham Wrexham are offering me a three year deal on more money but at the end of the day and, and what I never said to Cheltenham was um, because I didn't want to weaken my position was I'd actually said to Sophie I said well if Cheltenham offered me a three year deal on the same money I'll stay I will stay but again I'm not going to go to Cheltenham and say oh yeah by the way if you give me a three year deal on the same money I'll stay because I'm worth more than that. So, um, and then the manager made it pretty clear that there wasn't a contract on the table there and then. So I said, well, I've got to go. And he was like, well, no, you're not going anywhere unless it's this amount of money. You're my captain. You're a league one captain. Uh, you know, this is the amount of money they have to pay. So then it took him a while to negotiate and, and while then finally got there in the end. But yeah, it was, that was quite a stressful time to be honest with you. In terms of said about stress and football and why that was a whole new stress I've never experienced that before because it was getting towards the end of a window so I wouldn't have been able to move I would have been locked in at Cheltenham um, with 10-11 months on the contract um, with no power I couldn't have gone to Wrexham um, so therefore they would have had my hands tied they could have then offered me whatever they kind of wanted being a family man security was more important um, I'd have possibly had to sign it um, but I told them on the phone before I said, look, if you offer me a big contract, I will not be signing it um, because of what it had got to. So, so, yeah, it was a little bit messy the way I left, but I loved it. I loved it there. I loved the club. It was Mate, you, want, you wouldn't want to do a Peter Oldham o- 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 wingy, would you, when he's just sat inside oh, yeah, the no, running ground? Drive up, yeah. <laughs> drive up to Wrexham. Let me in. Yeah, imagine I just wait outside hoping it goes through. Yeah. yeah no, back yeah. in the day, and he'd done that, so he thought he was getting a move to, I think it was QPR at the time. Was it QPR? Yeah, it was, yeah. So, and uh, he, on deadline day, he drove down to QPR and waited outside thinking he was getting a move and he just, <laughs> just didn't materialise. He had to drive back home and play for the club. It's fucking horrendous. Yeah. It was class. It was so funny on it. It was so funny. Oh, like, yeah. Everyone That's just the story that was there forever, oh. isn't it? Yeah, it was, it was so stressful. I didn't sleep. I didn't sleep for like days. And I actually like started becoming ill. I was run down. And to be fair, in them two weeks, I played two games for Cheltenham. I think a lot of people at the time in the dressing room were saying, you're in playing still. You're at risk of injury. Like I'd be saying to the club, "I'm I'm leaving by not playing," but I just wasn't in my nature. So yeah, I, I ended up a little bit run down from it, and uh, finally went through. And yeah, great decision. I think I think the big thing for you as well is you've obviously been in those lower leagues for so long, and you know how quickly like things can change in football. So those opportunities, they, they come along really fast. And I think as a footballer, people at times give, give footballers a bad rep, but I completely understand it because those opportunities change so fast. If you didn't get that move at that point, that move may not be there in January or that move, move yeah. might not have been there in 12 months. And like you said, a three-year contract, you probably know more than anyone. How many one-year contracts have you signed probably in, in those league league one and league yeah, two you know, seasons? You know, two years, it, it, yeah, two years. Yeah. Uh, it's it's right in the Premier League, you know. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And the thing is, like I said before, we're all a commodity, and you are literally. Um, this is one of the reasons why my family haven't moved up here. So, kind of live at home and home, but 
home up here and home down there. They come up for the games and stuff, and they and uh, I travel home um, days off. But the reason why they haven't moved up here like permanently is because even though I've got a three year contract in football, if you have two two months, for example, bad bad performances, you you aren't you're not playing. You're you might even take a couple of games, a couple of bad performances. You're not going to be playing. Or if you pick up an injury, you're then on the, the sideline, scrappy. You could be sold. You could be let go. You could, you could, you know, be forced out of that club. Mate, so change of I'll, management's huge as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that could happen. Change of management. It only changes a, a gaffer yeah. to change, and then he doesn't like your face don't fit. And no matter what contract you got, you're out, aren't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. And it can make your life hell. I don't think it would here exactly, but in football, I've seen it happen. But and my family moved up here, especially with school and stuff and, and whatever. But then I could find myself having to, you know, move my family away again, back home. And, and it just, it's it's tough. I'm away from them four days a week, four nights a week. And for me, they're, like I said before, my everything. So it is hard. But at the same time, it sacrifices its choices and you feel like you're making the right choice for them. And, and yeah, so you literally, if you, you could be injured and, you know, it could mess everything up. But yeah. It's uh, it's funny old one, really. Yeah, I, I, I love your motivation for or your, your kind of motivation for moving, though, mate. It, you know, I half expect you to say because of the cameras and everything. I mean, obviously, I've spoke to you long enough now in this conversation, though that probably wasn't going to be the case. But yeah, that, that setting that new challenge, mate, in trying to kind of do what you achieved at Cheltenham at Wrexham is really cool. How did you find the? Um, I don't know if you'd ever played at sort of that such a lower league. But how did you feel like? Because again, watching the show, it, it's hard to really gauge how much of a challenge it was for Wrexham with yourself and the other lads coming down from the higher leagues. But obviously, as a non, you know, football fan, really these days, I'd assume that if you've got a load of players from a higher league, you'd run through the lower league. But is that is that true, or is it still quite a tough, different style of play down there? It's so unique this club because obviously every game for every opposition is still the same this season. And there are a lot of people that love the show, and why there's also people that are jealous and resent you and you're their cup final because whether that's on a Saturday you're playing against a team who might a lad in that team might think well if I play well today they could sign me that's a club that could potentially sign me so it's, it is literally everyone's cup final everyone hates you you know the fans uh, turn up more you, every every game we played last season it was a record attendance pretty much at their stadiums um, and also in that league you're playing on plastic pitches, three games are on AstroTurf, which the thing is, we've all come from um, playing on school pitches, playing in parks, playing, you know, and we do get used to your surroundings and we've been used to, we've been lucky with pitches and what you play on a Saturday and stuff. But at the same time, you know, you've got all them elements against you. You've got, like I said, their cup final, the fans hating you, biggest moment of their, their biggest game of the season and, and yeah it, it's tough getting out of that league was really tough it took us the two years and, and it only took us to break the records last year to, to get out of it um, but yeah, it's, it, yeah to get out of that league was, was a huge achievement especially with the pressure of the documentary the noise around the bullshit um, that that was that made it ten times harder really but we've dealt with it and we're, we're kind of used to it now yeah, and how are you guys getting on this season so far? Yeah, we're doing all right. We got smashed on the weekend. We lost 5 0 away at Stockport. Was, uh, yeah. Fucking Stockport again. <laughs> yeah, still, yeah. Fucking, still giving you a run for your money, are they? Um, yeah, that, that hurt. It was, yeah, it's, it's tough, but also at the same time, in football, you've got to, that game wasn't great, but you've got to move on because you've got another one coming Saturday. So we're doing okay. I think we're in the playoffs at the moment. I don't tend to look at the league myself because I worry about I'm worried more about us than other other people. Yeah, fair one. Do you tend to just keep to like take it game by game? Then I take it. Yeah, so that's all you can do. I mean, it's such a cliche in sport and football and whatever, but that's all you can do. If you look too far ahead, you end up tripping up, as I always say. But it's it's yeah, you've got to. If we focus on ourselves, we make sure we're right and we're getting the results. Who cares about everyone, anyone else? As long as we're doing the right things, um, we should be all right. Yeah, and um, where are we in the season currently? I've lost track. What do you mean? So how many games played at the moment? Not many. What no, was it, like 15 in? We've played nine in the league. Nine? Is it? Okay. Yeah, nine, yeah. We've got 37 now, yeah. <laughs> they got loads, mate, yeah. yeah that, those okay. leagues, man, are like, was it 24 teams a league? 
Yeah, yeah, that's it, yeah. Is it? Yeah, so probably uh, probably early days to ask uh, what your what your thoughts are about getting promotion this season. Well, that's not right. Obviously, that's yeah. yeah. Well, th- this is it, and I guess, you know, again, with the show still going, there's going to be a, a, a the same amount of pressure to get up again. And then I, and I guess, like, with that prospect, mate, like you've, you've kind of alluded to it a couple of times where you're obviously, uh, you know, sort of, sort of later on in your career now you've got a lot of younger lads like as you move up those leagues does that does that kind of concern you at all in regard to your position with the club or does it actually motivate you and is that the challenge that you actually came to Wrexham for I mean not in a, a big headed way I, I believe I can play in this league 100% I know that I've won it I definitely can play in the league above and I know age and time is probably not on my side to people on the outside but I look after myself I'm in, I'm in good shape like I say, I played, I played every minute of every game since I've been at this club, which is in itself, I'm very proud of that. You know, to to be the oldest outfield player up until a couple of weeks ago, to have that kind of accolade is, I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of that. But yeah, ability wise, I do, you know, I know I can do it. I know I can do it, in, like I say, in the league above. And, and I don't think that's me being unrealistic and um, whatever. But yeah, I mean, the only thing that's possibly not on my side is, is, time and age really it just depends when we get up when the club gets up yeah and no, a fair one mate and the, the other thing I was wanted to ask as well we kind of touched on it a bit earlier but I know in the first season there was a scene where they walked into the club's gym and it was it looked like something from the fucking 80s <laughs> like are they are they investing a lot into like their sports science and their s and and their nutrition to keep you guys like playing to the best standard for as long as possible now yeah it's the, like I said when, when I signed it was like here and now it's like championship uh, in terms of staff, the number of staff. There's four or five physios. There's The gym is phenomenal. It's um, The only thing the club's really missing is the training ground and they're trying to sort out the stand as well, the stand behind the goal. Um, but once the club gets the, the, the facilities in terms of training ground, the stand behind the goal, of course, increases the revenue um, capacity. But... The training grounds, the the kind of one thing that will hold the club back for the for the near future. Um, yeah, I think everything else is in place. They they want to do the right things, which definitely helps. But sometimes people cut corners. And there's, there's, that's not happening here. So um, yeah, it's a, it's an exciting time to be part of the club, and definitely an exciting time to be a fan. It's, it's yeah, it's, it's pretty pretty good. Yeah, and, and and just on the fans as well. You, you mentioned earlier as well about obviously they've done so much for the club and the community, and the, obviously the the club was owned by the fans initially, right before before those two bought it. And the, the fans seem, and I know fans are in every fucking city, but this the fans obviously seem mega passionate about the club. Like, do you, you know, do you kind of have like much interaction with the fans, and does it feel different to other teams that you've played for, or is it, are all fans pretty much the same and they're just spotlighted because of the show? Or are they really different? Yeah, I mean, Wrexham's an old mining town, so it's got a lot of history. There's never really been a lot of money in Wrexham, and I find that places that have you know less money, you, you generally find more passionate, passionate people. So I've definitely found that since I've been here. Um, the fans have been quality. They've turned up in their numbers since day one. I mean, we sell out. We sell out the stadium every single week. Tickets are like gold dust. But not only that, like they're spending their hard-earned money to follow the club when they're earning probably not enough money to to sustain that. Um, but that just shows a lot about the people in the in the town and, and their passion and, and yeah, who they are really. When you meet them. Luckily enough to meet them on a weekly basis, they're they're always so so nice and and just so so happy, they're just so happy at the moment. It's it's, it's great. It's great. <laughs> to see you. I mean, it's a bit bonkers, really. Wrexham's like a, I call it a bubble because I live outside of Wrexham. I'm like forty minutes outside, but when I go into that bubble, uh, I, I literally pop in. I go to work and then I need to get out of that bubble because it's a bit surreal. It's kind of like like you said before about being famous in that town. It's yeah, it's bizarre. You've got to guy kind of get in. Do your work, yeah. <laughs> to normality, get your, get your kind of feet back on the ground, really. So yeah, they've, they've been they've been phenomenal. That must be mental. Yeah, it must be absolutely mental, mate. And um, mate, uh, just touching on obviously your uh, your recent tragedy with your dad and stuff. Um, I know he was a obviously I've known you a long time, and I knew he was a massive supporter of you. Um, just just wondering how you've been coping with that and dealing with that 
while you're playing and stuff like that? Yeah, it's been really, really hard, actually. Uh, a lot harder than I thought. It's, um, yeah, I mean, he, he passed away so so suddenly. Um, the thought, you know, it was, he, he'd been unwell, um, but we didn't realise that he, you know, he had leukaemia, um, blood cancer. So found that out on literally the Saturday and he passed away on the Monday. So it was kind of, it was so, so fast and it was literally on the eve of the pre-season tour. Um, yeah, he was my my biggest fan, and yeah. you know, it's hard to say it. And he would have said it as well. But like, I was what he kind of lived for. Really, he loved it. He would come to every every game he possibly could. He would definitely watch the games from home. Um, and as you say, like, I remember growing up playing for school and things like that. He would be at every game. He'd always be at my school games. He'd be, you know, um, yeah. Like I said, my biggest yeah. fan. In a way, you kind of when it's it's your dad and, and he sings your praises everywhere, every like left, right, and centre. It must be like that. It must be boring for everyone to hear it all the time. <laughs> um, but that's just them being proud, isn't it? And it's been it's been yeah. it has been tough. It's kind of made me question um, a lot about myself. What's what what things are worth in life? It's um, yeah, it's. It is tough. It's been it's been really tough, but I've kind of had to keep it together. Like I said about um, show weaknesses in in this sport, in this industry, um, you kind of you get preyed on. So at the same time, I've kind of had to just be like you know crack on, and and that's that's the way I've got to approach it. Really, um, yeah, it's been, it's been fucking hard. Yeah, I can imagine. Right, it must be so hard for you, man. Because like I said, I remember even when we was doing like schoolboy trials back in the day, and he was uh, he was always there <laughs> cheering you on. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. You was a bit, you was a bit of a prodigy, mate. When you were as a kid, I don't know. You used to you used to score a few goals, mate. I, could... <laughs> I was a winger, man. Centre back. Yeah, I know. I remember. Um, but yeah, mate. It's um, with regards to your dad. So w- was he ill? Was he for a, for a period of time, and then he didn't know what was wrong with him? Yeah. So he um, he it was it was I don't know. I can't put a finger on it. It was definitely over a year, but. Dad would come to games and he would get off before I'd see him. So he was kind of hiding away from me, which is hard. I'd be like, I'd come in, you know, after a game into the lounge and I'd be like, oh, where's, where's Dad? I, he's, he had to shoot off. I had to get back to Plymouth, you know, it's a five-hour drive. Um, yeah, all right, okay, fair enough. I'd ring him. Yeah, all right, fair enough. Um, and I'd chat to him and, and it just became, people would come up to me when I was back in Plymouth and be like, um, Sorry, I say it like I was in Plymouth. I was when I went for my to my mate's yeah. funeral. There was a guy. I was literally had to go and get off. Um, a guy at the funeral who who uh, worked with my dad, and he was like, "Oh, mate, I'm just I'm a bit worried about your dad." Um, and I was like, "You know, some people people have been saying that it doesn't look well. It looks like he's lost a bit of weight and whatever." And I rang him straight away. I was like, "Dad, what's up? Like, what have you been to get checked?" And he was like. Yeah, 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 I'm getting checked. Yeah, yeah, I'm getting checked. And uh, it just kind of like palmed it off. It was almost like he was too scared to to face the reality that he might have something, um, you know. And then I, I saw him on, last time I saw him was Father's Day. So um took him for breakfast. In, and uh, yeah, it was evident then that, you know, he wasn't well. Um, and yeah, just there's just a lot of things. You just, you don't see the, must have had, swelling and and bruising and stuff all over his body because when when he eventually went into hospital of course he lasted two days so you don't it it has to have been in there a long time for for that to have happened um but yeah it's just it's it's like i say it's like a bit of me's a bit of me's missing really is it's at the time you're kind of in shock but since it's happened you almost feel a bit lost at times um my wife's been class. She's just understood it totally. Um, you know, she's seen when I've been a bit vacant when I'm in a room with the kids. Just take yourself upstairs for a bit. You know? um, yeah, it's 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 your dad in it at the end of the day. Your dad's yeah. the one you to all your sports as a kid. Well, I say that generally speaking. Um, but yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's yeah, it's, it's hard. Yeah, I can imagine, mate. It uh, shows sometimes how precious life is, isn't it? And how quickly things can change, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, like, as even when you go back through videos and um, 
things like you know this, when he's been up here and stayed here you've got videos of my kids jumping on him and like playing around with him and, and whatever and then you actually watch that video properly and you can see like my little girls on his shoulders and he's like in evidently in pain but at the time you just he's hiding it so well um and you're like fucking hell fuck said why didn't you just speak up and say and but again, that's a man thing, isn't it? This is why we kind of, well, this is why we do this podcast, mate, is because yeah, yeah. a lot of men, we we hide this sort of shit, don't we? And we let it go and we, you know, it, not just mental health, but physical health. And I think that's that's one of the big problems that we've got as as men. We just don't talk. We we think we'll be okay. And, you know, like with your dad, you know, if, if people are feeling unwell for her for a amount of time, go and get yourselves checked out. And that's why with a lot of my clients as well, I make them do regular blood tests mm -hmm. and they always say, oh, I'm feeling okay. I'm not, but I do genuinely, if they're not, especially if they're overweight or whatever, I, I say to them, go and do a blood test. It's, it's a hundred quid and you get like a bit of peace of mind, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, that has been really tough. You may really sorry to hear that. That's yeah. It sucks, man. Yeah. That's true. It's, what can you say really? It's, it's, I suppose again, learning now and if it happens to my, friends or close friends and whatever i think even people in the days after are like you're right you're right and it's like um you're actually like, i was in shock i didn't realize until recently i was in shock for the first few weeks because we went on tour and everything was just like go 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 um but it's actually when the dust settles and then you have all the memories and things like that that's when it's it's harder i mean for me i played that chelsea game in america um i'm warming up and Literally, I've got, I've got tears coming down my face, and I'm like, I'm hiding it from everyone, not letting anyone see it. Maybe that's another issue. Why, why, why should I do that? But again, it's the industry I'm kind of in. Um, yeah. In the first game of the season, you know, I'd always speak to that before, and I'd always text him, or if he was at the game, I'd speak to him. Um, but he would always text before or after games, always, and that's that's probably when it's been the hardest. Really, around games, it's been yeah, it's been been tough but I feel like I'm getting better now I talk to people about it I do talk to people I try not to bore people um, which is hard because people don't really want to hear it but at the same time it's my therapy isn't it it's it's yeah but mate I think I think that's again that's a little bit of that stigma I think though isn't it like we just assume that people don't want to hear our shit but you know often people would prefer to hear that than something worse to happen you know what I mean so yeah so I mean yeah. it's trying to be relatable isn't it that's the way you try and come across I suppose if people can be yeah. relatable and yeah one of my mates is going through shit now with his mum and, and I'm trying to be trying not to interfere but at the same time letting him know like you know I'm there daily really yeah you gotta be mate um mate and then just a just a quick one I guess uh just probably the last question man we'll probably let you crack on um and this is probably one that you've not even really thought about much because you've still got plenty of seasons left in you i'm sure mate but have you thought about like life after football you mentioned obviously it'd be quite quite a tough one you miss the changing rooms have you thought about much about what you were would be looking to do would it be coaching would it just be family what's your plans and, uh, yeah a lot of people a lot of people say to me like you'll be a manager aren't you and it's just like that's just a throwaway comment. I mean, yeah, do I have uh, attributes? Possibly. But at the same time, it's not that easy. You've got to get lucky. You've got to fall on the right thing. So for me, if I'm being absolutely honest, I'm chilled. I'm, I'm pretty relaxed about when my time to finish is finishing. If it's this season, if it's next season, season after, whatever, then I'm, I'm relaxed about that. I feel like I'm comfortable with it in terms of how I would feel uh, making the right decision. Um, but also for what I'm doing, I would love to be staying in football because again, it's my passion, but at the same time, I'm not going to put the pressure on myself to say you are going to be a coach because it's a bit of a rat race. There's so many people going for such few jobs um, in football and also in football, is there enough honesty and are people in it for the right reasons at times people will stab each other in the back. I'm kind of, I'm a, I'm a very straight up guy. I will, I, I don't really like bullshit. I like to, um, say it as it is, uh, you know, say it as I see it, really. Um, so, yeah, it would be it'd, be it'd be tough to kind of get in there when you've got people. I wouldn't step up. I wouldn't want to stand on someone else's toes to look after myself, let's put it that way. Um, mm. But then 
in the, at the same time, sometimes when I'm, I feel like when I'm done with football, I'll be done with it completely. It is really, believe it or not, it is such a stressful job. It is. Mm. Like, I don't, I don't yeah, mean no that way. I'm not saying like I'm ungrateful, but it is a highly stressful job. There's so many pressures on you daily, weekly. Um, and, you know, even social media, I kind of don't tap into it too much, but there is. So would it be nice to just walk away and be a postman or something, you know, stress free, <laughs> stay fit. Um, yeah, again, I feel like I'd be comfortable with that. And even if I was stacking shelves in um, a supermarket, I, I feel like I'd just, just get on with it because, again, I don't feel like I've got enough pride to stop me thinking that's not okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm relaxed about it, let's put it that way. Obviously, my family, I'm, my, my, my main job in my life is being a father at the end of the day. So I'll do what's right, right for them, and I'll try and do what's right for them. Being a competitive guy, sorry, I'm blabbering on, but being a competitive guy, I've always been highly competitive, annoyingly competitive. So um, I want to be the best dad in the world. That's, that's me being competitive. So I've got to try and do what's right, what's right for them. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent, mate. Yeah, yeah I agree good. with that, mate. But as I say, mate, cross that bridge when you get to it. Plenty of time yet, right? We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, legend, mate. I think uh, unless Danny, you got any other questions? No, that's all good, man. Thanks mate. for coming on, Ben. Yeah, appreciate your time, mate. Thank you so much. No worries. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Appreciate it. Cheers, appreciate mate. It.